So I f um, <laughs> Andrew has lots of explaining to do, is how I t titled uh, the, the today's talk. But um, so here, here it goes. Um, I first encountered the term hippie modernism about 25 years ago in an essay by Lorraine Wilde, a contributor to the catalog for this show. The term was mentioned passingly in the context of the design program at Cranbrook Academy of Art, a reference to the process-oriented character of a certain type of early 1970s design. Although there were no accompanying Ill images to illustrate this provocative term, I could not help but conjure an arresting image in my mind. Perhaps Lorraine was thinking of a poster that documented a road trip in 1973 by 15 students and faculty undertaken in a Winnebago from Detroit to New York, obviously pre-lawsuits and trigger warnings. The black and white broadside uh, mapped their route and a lexicon of design terms surveyed the terrain of ideas they encountered along the way, terms such as architecture machine, software, democratic design, and design freaks. And a map masterly collaged with the signs and symbols of the roadside vernacular, a gesture right out of the Venturi and Scott Brown Las Vegas playbook. The project also embodied a hippie otherness. The poster, in, like the air inside that packed van, exuded some kind of funk. Titled The Cranbrook Design Trip, the double entendre spoke for itself. After all, what could be more hippie than a road trip inside an RV transformed into a nomadic design studio for eight days? Despite the clarity that this example offered me, the term still contained its unresolved dissonance. Were the hippie and the modern opposing concepts or complementary ones? Why does the notion of the hippie seem so estranged from modernism itself? At first glance, the culture of the hippies evokes not the modern, but the pre-modern and the pre-industrial. An affinity for 19th century pioneer dress and its agrarian way of life, vividly captured in photos of rural communes, the stylish period clothing of the Victorian era, era Wild West, said to have emanated from the vintage clothing stores of San Francisco and the Red Dog Saloon in Nevada, an early site of acid rock or its counterpart, the recurring figure of the Native, Ameri Native American Indian sorry, as a countercultural touchstone representing a more authentic spiritual connection between man and nature. In these ways, the hippies anticipate the postmodern search for historical symbolism and identity. But the countercultural scene also embraced modernism's fascination with new media, materials, and technologies. Tape music, synthesized sound, feedback and distortion, lighting effects, slide projectors, portable video cameras, television itself, plastics, mylar, and computers. But unlike the technocratic impulse that viewed scientific advances as inherently progressive and socially good, the hippie moderns sought alternatives for such technologies, which were increasingly adapted for personal creative effect and collective betterment. For instance, video and television could fulfill its democratic potential. Computing could be for personal use and no longer the sole purview of military and corporate elites. Technology could be made appropriate for local context and more environmentally sound. The urban environment could be rehabilitated rather than euphemistically renewed, and man and nature could be brought into ecological balance. These ameliorations and alterations signal a transformation of modernity in, through encounters with its hippie other. In a larger context of the counterculture, the hippie modern sought a recuperation of the avant-garde's utopic dream of integrating art into everyday life. It did so by fusing art and politics, and by creating alternative ways of living, and thus producing the artifacts, rituals, and experiences that were necessary for this new life. Hippie modernism marks the tension between the modern characterized as universal, timeless, rational, and progressive, and its countercultural other, which adopts a more local, timely, emotive, and often irreverent and radical disposition. I argue that hippie modernism is a momentary reconciliation of these seemingly opposed values as a way of resolving the impasse that faced post-war cultural modernity, which was caught between the proverbial rock of technocratic progress and the hard place of impending social disaster that erupted in crisis in the 1960s, and which would be later very differently reconciled under the rubric of postmodernism in the 1970s and 1980s. The path forward in art historical terms 
was split between those artistic movements more aligned with deeper investigations into the increasingly essential properties of a particular medium, its reductive practice, or increasingly autonomous status. So here I would cite abstract expressionism, color field painting, minimalism, for example. And those movements that actively saw an expansion of the arts into a plurality of new forms, hybrid media, and interactive experience. Here we might cite expanded cinema, intermedia, installation art, and performance. I think this is what Machunas was getting at with this diagram. Of these choices, hippie modernism would follow the latter course through experiments that drew upon the theatrical qualities and the participatory actions of the happening, embraced Fluxus's democratic spirit in its everyone is an artist philosophy, explored the sensorial and immersive experiences, and experimented with the fluid nature of light and sound as well as their interactive qualities as kinetic art. From pop art, it drew lessons about popular culture as a source of inspiration and entertainment as well as its potential for social critique, at least when that happened. But more importantly, it also saw from pop art the dangers of market commodification. Despite these influences, the fate of most countercultural production was that it would be undertaken outside the boundaries of art proper, beyond its studios, galleries, and museums, and enacted in public spaces and places of popular life. In the streets, in parks, in concert halls, in discotheques, and in theaters. The hippie modern, I don't uh, evoke that term to delineate a style, but rather to denote a historical moment. The creative eruption of the countercultural period that I bracket between the Merry Pranksters cross-country acid trip of 19, in 1964 and the OPEC oil embargo of 1973-1974, which brought into dramatic relief the limits of Western society's progress and geopolitical power. From the thrilling promise of a post-scarcity society to the sobering reality of a stalled economy, the decade unfolded with dramatic speed, but concluded like so many idled cars queued at the gas pump. By evoking the word hippie, I don't mean to suggest that all or even any of the artists in the exhibition self-identified with the term or would have described themselves as one, although maybe some did. The hippie was and remains a highly mediated figure, one used rhetorically within this project as the same kind of empty signifier to which it created many different agendas. Or as the diggers once said, the hippie was just another convenient bag for the identity hungry to climb in. I adopt the term hippie modernism as my convenient art historical bag with which to gather and identify various countercultural remnants. By doing so, I risk a similar co-option that the diggers tried to burn and bury in their death of hippie event to cleanse the hate Ashbury of its insipid commercialism. This is my funeral. <laughs> In order to define what hippie modernism may mean, one must examine the notion of the hippie itself, at least the terminology. This represents an interesting challenge since the term was originally an imposed label and not one birthed by the counterculture itself. Prior to the broadly mo adapted moniker of the hippie, it might have been words like freak or head that served to denote an affiliation or disaffection with the conventions and conformity of post-war American life. By the time the hyped Summer of Love had been promoted by the media, which virtually ensured the migrations of hundreds of thousands of youth to the Bay Area in 1967, terms such as weekend hippie or plastic hippie were already being deployed by the faithful to expose the superficial commitment and shallow engagement of young and, quite frankly, not so young interlopers. Eventually, the term was widely used by both adherents and detractors alike, becoming useful enough as a linguistic tool to endure. Used to identify or self-identify self with an emergent class of largely youthful pre uh, dissenters to the normative values of mainstream America, the word hippie is historically associated with the rejection of establishment institutions and bourgeoisie values, uh, opposition to the war, whether Vietnam or nuclear proliferation, and the embrace of pacifist beliefs, the championing of personal freedom, including recreational drug use and sexual liberation, the adoption of an ecological view of nature and humankind's role and responsibilities within it, and a tilt towards Eastern spirituality and mysticism and away from organized forms of Western religion, amongst many other things. 
Despite this core ethos and philosophy, the visuality of hippie lifestyle and culture resonates most strongly today, not only as a reflection of its distinctive aesthetic sensibility, but also as an affirmation of the power of the media to reflect and distort, above all, to disseminate those essential characteristics throughout the larger culture, spreading the word, but of course diluting the message in the process. Easily distilled to a series of cliched images and impressions, tie-dye, bongs, beads, painted vans, long hair, free love, etc., the figure of the hippie is not an unproblematic one. Compounding the issue was the characterization of the 1960s counterculture as a social and political failure, a theme taken up in great earnest, especially by conservative politicians and thinkers as they rode the wave of Reagan Thatcherism in the 1970s and 1980s. No wonder then that we are left with the meager choice of the clueless flower child, the naive tree hugger, and the slacker pothead as the period's troubled ambassadors. I don't think any visuals were needed. <laughs> we all know them now. <laughs> However, my objective is to contest that fate by drawing attention to this liminal period between an increasingly insular high modernism that furthered the cause of art's autonomy in society and emergent hippie modernism that engaged new forms and experimental practices that drew upon the early modern avant-garde's desire to dissolve art into everyday life. The period under consideration is a historical transition from one epoch to another, or epoch to another, from an industrial to a post-industrial society, and from a culture of a ossified high modernism to a nascent form of postmodernism. Because of this transitional status and its rejection of disciplinary boundaries, the counterculture until very recently existed in the margins of so many art, architectural, and design histories. This project attempts to foreground such practices and ex excavate such histories. The modern conjures the figure of the machine as its preferred metaphor, a creation of man, but with no trace of the hand, all smoothness and refinement, an abstraction of labor, an efficient, if indifferent, labor-saving device, something distinct and apart from nature. By contrast, the hippie evokes not the machine, but the body, sensual and emotive, connecting to man and to nature, a direct rather than distant connection, wherein man and nature are part of a shared cybernetic system. In the mo if the modern was the hardware, then the hippie was the software, offering a new operating system for Spaceship Earth. It is the collision of these philosophies and aesthetics that defines the project center of gravity, the tension between the hippie and the modern. Now, I'd just like to run through some examples, uh, illustrate some examples from the exhibition, although a lot of them have been shown already. Um, the interplay of the hippie and the modern can be gleaned in various ways throughout the show, through its process, appearance, and politics. I see the hippie in the patchwork assembly of drop cities, handcrafted zones, and the modern in their avant-garde notion of creating a community to integrate art and life. I recognize the concept in Victor Papanek and George Seeger's tin can radio, a dung-fueled receiver for the developing world, which fascinated the faculty at the Ohm School in Germany, which were the successors to the Bauhaus but who were nevertheless repelled by its anti-aesthetic form and the decorative cozies knitted by its local owners. I'm reminded of today's network culture in the powerful collages of Super Studio Super Surface, a cybernetic grid of modernism enveloping the world, its hippie inhabitants happily living in a world without objects. The symbol par excellence of modernism, the grid, becomes a space for ubiquitous access and radical democracy and participation, a patchwork of voices and a field of positions in de Bretville's designs. I can learn through doing a favorite trope of the counterculture that sought to free education from the tyranny of schooling by making one's own spaces from a plethora of cookbooks, offering up recipes for modern living, whether plastic and inflatable or modern and mo or wooden and modular. We tried to decipher the message of the psychedelic poster, its vibrating palette, a Joseph Albers color exercise done, to quote Dave Hickey, backwards, inside out, too much, and exactly wrong. We read the thoughts of Marshall McLuhan, Buckminster Fuller, and Jerry Rubin, whose counterculture ideas are not locked up in dutiful text blocks on Gutenberg's press bed, but released onto Quentin Fiore's fluid cinematic book pages, an ironic testament to the fact that the revolution wasn't te televised as much as it was printed. 
I'm immersed in the wondrous images of John Whitney's technically sophisticated films, whose micro and macro compositions evoke the sacred geometries of a more timeless cosmological order. I wander through Helen Newton Harrison's sensuous cybernetic orchard of fruit trees under grow lights, a biosphere for planetary survival. In these and other projects in the exhibition, implicit and explicit critiques of modernity are made manifest in the work and our shared experience of them decades later. What is important and perhaps most forgotten was the sense of impending threat of revolution that seemed possible in the hectic social turmoil of the 1960s as a collection of dissident factions, such as anti-war uh, anti demonstrators. Whoops, I think I got out of sequence here, sorry. There we go. Anti-war demonstrators, draft resistors, civil rights protesters, black militants, gay rights activists, environmentalists, feminists, anarchists, communalists, etc., all coalesced against the establishment. The proliferation of alternate futures and utopic visions that were encouraged, enacted, or postulated during this period testify to the possibility of creative imagining unleashed by the prospect of imminent change. That such radical social change did not come to pass at that time does not equate to ultimate failure or even affirmation of the neoconservative backlash that followed it. Any more than winning a battle constitutes winning the war. The late cultural theorist Stuart Hall, writing contemporaneously about the countercultural scene in 1969 in an essay entitled The Hippies, an American Moment, argues for a more imbricated notion of the hippie activist dichotomy by outlining four ways in which the political contestation of the system had been made manifest by the hippie. So here I'll just outline some of those. First, the figure of the hippie imparts style to the movement, giving itself not only a legible identity, but also making the question of style itself a political statement. Second, they have invented new ways of confronting established authority by performing the tactics of obscenity, shock, play acting, and the put on, adding dermatological flair to the revolutionary imperative. Third, the hippie lives out a set of values that are counter to those of straight society. Whoops. Over here. In this regard, Hall drafts a list of more than 25 opposing values between straight and hippie culture, such as affluent poor, work play, word image, power love, postponing gratifications, existential now, instrumental and expressive, and so on. Such values set the stage for the hippie to enact what he calls cultural guerrilla warfare of the social consciousness, becoming what Hall presently argues is the front line of a new kind of politics of postmodern, post-industrial society, the politics of cultural rebellion. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, the hippies actively model the future society that they envision through their negation of the present one. Hall states that it is not possible yet to make and live in the new society, but it is possible to catch a glimpse of what it could be like, to sketch out a model of future possibilities through broken forms, split structures of hippie life and consciousness. What the activists plan and organize for, the hippies start to construct, quote, within the womb of pre-revolutionary society, unquote. Or as Hall summarized it, hippies create scenes, activists build the movement. Politicos fight to enact change in the power structures that shapes the future of society, uh, the future direction of society, while the hippies imagine an alternative tomorrow and stage it. The difference between utopia deferred, according to Baudrillard, versus utopia now. In effect, this is the reverse of Marxist thinkers like Herbert Marcuse, who had imagined the art's potential in a liberated society would that it be a, the beneficiary of such transformation, not the instigator of it. From a design standpoint, the prototyping of alternative realities or the modeling of possible futures is reflected in the Digger's famous call to action, create the condition that you describe. From a design standpoint, the prototyping of alternative realities or the modeling of possible futures is reflected in the digger. Oh, sorry, I reread that. Gosh, sorry. Um, I argue that the success and virality of hippie ideas was contingent on its visual representation and enactment, the ability to rapidly prototype post revolutionary life now. This was praxis, not theory. 
In their struggle to create a new social, cultural, and political and ecological utopia, the counterculture expressed its political activism and activated its cultural radicalism in new and imaginative ways. By doing so, they created a new sensibility or aesthetic in the broadest sense of the term. It is this sensibility that I've defined as a hippie modernism, an aesthetics of refusal, one that rejects the given parameters of a practice, obviates the boundaries of a defined field, or alters the course of an instrumental technology. It is also fundamentally a form of positive projection and not just critical negation, one that envisions utopic potentials, models alternative experiences, and channels liberatory futures. Of course, many of the issues and problems of the counterculture identified nearly 50 years ago remain partially or even entirely unresolved. However, such radical experiments and utopic propositions linger in the cultural imagination because of their prescient ability to envision alternative futures, albeit ones that continue to be played out in the same fragmented way in the same contradictory system in which they were originally conceived. In this way, it is no more failed than the presumed failures of the 1960s itself, which if measured over the long haul and from today's perspective, shows its persistence rather than its abandonment. Thank you. <laughs>